Hello, and welcome to Research This, the podcast where we do the research and give you the answers. Today's topic is home automation, and this is a topic that it would take many episodes to cover in its entirety. Today, we're just going to cover some of the basics. We are living in the rise of the smart home, but what exactly is a smart home? A smart home, or home automation, or a home full of Internet of Things devices is controllable and connected. In essence, it's having your environment respond or complete tasks with little to no input from you. In a broader sense, home automation takes kind of that pop culture hacker mindset of things like Mr. Robot and merges it with this Jetsonian vision of the future. A home environment that can anticipate and respond to your various needs with fine control than was previously available. One of the major questions in regards to the smart home or home automation is what exactly can I do with it? And the major benefit of having a connected home is security, increased awareness of your environment. So smart sensors could alert you of a water leak, a smart valve could turn the water off to prevent any damage, and you could get notifications while you're on vacation. Having connected cameras and locks can give you control over who is coming and going from your home, and you can view that information in real time from anywhere. Secondary benefits mostly revolve around having your home customized to your preferences. So with one command, you can cause many devices to react and perform tasks for you. Historically, home automated systems and security were reserved for the wealthy, but as the internet has brought about egalitarian knowledge, it has also set free home automation. The current smart home market is flooded with DIY products and systems, and there are no universal standards, no correct way to set up a system, and given that you're brave enough, no limits. Uh, the flip side of this, it can often feel like you're adrift in a sea of technical jargon and uncertainty when setting up and utilizing these products. And if you aren't comfortable with researching and tinkering, setups using free software, Home Assistant or OpenHAB combined with things like Raspberry Pis or Arduino boards are not really the route for you. That said, there are multiple levels of automation aimed at consumers of all technical levels. There are the high-end installer-based systems like Control 4 and Christian PYNG. These companies have proven track records of providing safe and stable products installed by local professionals and with local customer support. You can do a quick search for home automation companies in your area to kind of get an idea of what's available and the cost, but these systems are very pricey. Uh, they can run into the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. For people who want a system that just works and is easy to use, relatively inexpensive, basing your home automation on existing brands such as Smart things, Wink, Nest, this is really the way to go. These systems allow you to use brand name items that you hear about, you know, Hue Lights, the Amazon Echo, Google Home, Belkin Wemo switches, smart thermostats, and you have the ability to build up your system over time. You can use a variety of different brands and protocols and really evolve with the tech. The downside is it's kind of the wild west in home automation right now. A company that is doing well may not be around in five years. And while having more open protocols such as Bluetooth and Zigbee is great for diversity, in a few years time, one of these will probably rise above the others. So you have to be prepared to evolve your system as the tech improves. The next thing that people are interested in is the cost. And while you may not be able to put a price on seeing the reactions as people walk through your house and have it respond to them or move through your space and have art on the walls and the lighting and the entertainment settings change just for you, in day-to-day -day home automation, it's about convenience and you will pay for this convenience. Smart home products can be two to 10 times as expensive as their dumb counterparts. Smart light bulbs from Hue will set you back around $50 each for a color bulb, and an Apple HomeKit enabled August Smart Lock is currently going for $229, and when you compare this to a regular deadbolt you can get at the hardware store for $15, it can seem a little extravagant. So the next question that comes up is, can I set this up myself? And depending on your level of technical expertise, there are a few different ways you can go about this. If you have coding or script writing abilities, you're familiar working with Raspberry Pi, Python, you can basically create a system specifically tailored to your desires. 
So you can set up a Raspberry Pi with a USB stick that can control and receive Z-Wave frequencies, and then you could buy and install Z-Wave switches and bulbs, use software such as Home Assistant to customize exactly how, when, and why things occur within that system. If you're comfortable using most modern average tech devices, there are several systems that exist on the market now that you can pretty much use from the ground up. One of these is SmartThings. SmartThings is basically a hub that you would hook up to your router and it communicates to a variety of devices that are able to work with a SmartThings hub. So you can have connected light bulbs, you can have connected light switches, you can have garage door openers, a variety of everyday useful items that you would want to be able to control from your phone or a tablet or a computer anywhere. There are alternatives to SmartThings. The number one competitor right now is Wink and the Wink 2.0 hub just came out and it makes a lot of improvements over the original one. So before you decide which system to kind of jump into, it can be a good idea just to take a look at the items that you want to set up and control. So you might take a look at the specific garage door opener that you like, or you may take a look at the specific smart blinds that you like and see which one of those devices supports them or which one has better integration. Just because items claim that they work with another smart home product doesn't necessarily mean that they will work how you want them to or how you would anticipate. And it, it does not mean that they will work flawlessly. So smart lock security is a big topic on everyone's mind right now. We hear constantly about Internet of Things devices being hacked, being used as botnets, people being able to get access to your home network through insecure devices. And I won't lie, it can be difficult to find out real solid information about the levels of security on some of these devices. If you're buying devices from name brand companies that you're familiar with, you can be fairly certain that your devices will have at least a basic level of security. My hope and the hope of a lot of people in the home automation community right now is that the tech will evolve and security will evolve with it. But just because a few things are connected does not necessarily mean you'll want everything to be connected. You may feel safer if your smart lock isn't connected to your hub or other networks, or you may think it would be great to have a lock auto unlock when you arrive home. But for instance, if your bedroom is near the front door or you come and go very often, you may find yourself locked out or you may find your door unlocking at random times. How far away can you be before the door unlocks? And what if you lose your phone? Is there a backup? How easy is it to secure the system? If you have a break-in, how easy is it to re-secure the system? So these are things that you have to take into consideration. Other factors for consideration are, do you have Wi-Fi connectivity everywhere in your home or on your property that you would need it? Do you have cat cable ran? Do you have ethernet hookups available? Is your home in a safe area inside and out. It may seem counterintuitive. People who live in a high-risk area need these security items more. You just have to be aware of the environment that you live in and your location and your type of risk before jumping into a system. So someone who lives in an apartment building would probably be better served by secure locks and indoor cameras, and someone who lives in a more rural area may find that a really robust outdoor security system helps keep watch over all of their buildings, most of their property, and has a much better alternative to indoor cameras. If you have pets, that's certainly something to take into account. Some smart home products work off of motion or proximity sensors. If you have pets that roam around your house during the day, they could possibly set these sensors off. Also, are you a homeowner or a renter? If you rent or lease your home, there may be limits on what you can do as far as installation, changing out locks, running wires. The good news is just about every area of smart home technology has solutions that are suited to more transient use. If you're a homeowner, Local laws and your HOA may affect what you can do inside and outside of your home. You also may find that you can't run power wire or internet to a location that you need. Another factor in this is, are you looking for a long-term or a short-term solution? Many people wanna buy reliable products that they feel comfortable trusting in and using for many years. Home automation products can get expensive, so you may not want to buy into fledgling systems now or replace entire systems every few years. Other people may not wanna feel locked into using legacy technology and may want to have the latest and the greatest, and using more temporary systems can allow you to have that flexibility 
ability. The amount of disposable income and the effort you're willing to put into home improvement are very important when you're thinking about setting up home automation systems. These do not work flawlessly and they have many unique issues that you don't really find out about until you hook them up and begin using them. Items that improve security and safety, that improve energy efficiency, water sensors, smart thermostats, locks, security cameras, these could all be considered standard home improvement so it may not feel like an extraneous expense but things like smart fans and smart blinds and pressure sensors that cause cascades of reactions those may seem a little more frivolous and so you might approach those two facets differently in some cases you just don't know what issues will be until you get the product or the system in your home and use it network issues routers don't work with systems too large a space between mesh points valves outlets cables not being the right types or having the right kind of adapters or not in the right space. The reality is these items are less reliable than the marketing wants you to believe. And CES is not reality. So just because you see an item in a demo or in a video working for someone else does not necessarily mean it will work that exact way for you. One of the reasons is system compatibility. If you want your whole system to work together smoothly, a higher end professionally installed system is going to be pricey, but it will give you much more reliability, local customer service and support. So if something goes wrong, you can call someone to come out to your house that day and fix it. DIY and smart home appliances don't always mean that you can put all your eggs in one basket. Companies like Samsung and Google would love to have consumers buy their and only their product. And as long as there is customer demand for out of the box kits that just work within a single system, these companies will try to lock down what's available. But for the true home automation experimenter, having the ability to choose multiple devices and protocols from different companies really is better. You can get the best product from each company and diversify your home automation. Company A may not necessarily make the product you need, so you can get a little from company B and a little bit from company C, and for the most part, it will still work together. One of the big pushes in home automation right now is for standards. So these would be having multiple companies make many devices that will all work with each other communicating over open protocols. These would be things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. There are also a couple low power mesh network protocols. Zigbee and Z-Wave are the two most popular. So the big push right now is just for smart home products manufacturers to kind of pick a system and stick with it. One of the major areas of home automation is in the home theater. And if you want a connected system for audio, Sonos is the industry leader right now. You can buy the their speakers and have them connect and play the audio in a variety of speakers or just in certain areas of the house. But this is a very pricey system to buy into. A lower cost alternative would be to buy either Bluetooth audio speakers or to use an existing sound system with something like Chromecast audio. There are also products like the Harmony Hub and this could control any device that uses an IR blaster. Some of the newer Harmony Hubs can work without line of sight. So you could set up all of your home automation and audiovisual equipment in a closet and then still have full control over it from your phone or if you choose to use a device like the Google Home or the Amazon Echo with your voice. The last thing that I would just like to cover, how well systems will work for guests. So it doesn't really do you any good if you have this extremely amazing, awesome, but kind of complicated system and then people come over and flip like switches or make changes and then nothing works. One of the big disappointments for me was after I installed my Hue light system, I discovered when you flip the light switch off, the bulb goes off and it's unresponsive. And when you turn the light switch back on, the bulb has reset itself to 100% bright whiteness. And this is very disappointing. They do it for safety and I can understand why. But for me, the LifeX lights tend to work better because you can turn them off and when you turn them back on, they resume the setting they were last at. So if you had it at 50% brightness and a blue light, 
it'll return to that setting. If you turn the light on and off two times in quick succession, it will bring it up to a full bright white, again for security reasons. That system just seems to work a little better for me. I've so far had to return one hue light and one LifeX light for being unresponsive and not working with my system. That's a pretty high rate of failure compared to normal light bulbs. The convenience that I have using my Amazon Echo and these connected lights far outweighs any inconvenience from contacting the manufacturers and replacing these items. So that is just some of the basics regarding home automation. There is so much interesting information out there that I haven't had a chance to cover. I definitely will be revisiting this topic. If you have any topics that you would like for us to research, please feel free to contact us on Twitter at researchthispod or by email at researchthispod at gmail.com. The music from this episode is Window Pane by Sick Lawrence. That's S-E-C-L-O-R-A-N-C-E. And all of the music for the show so far I have gotten from the Free Music Archive and all of their songs are released under the Creative Commons license. So I would highly recommend that you check them out for a variety of free amazing music. You can use their music in your media. So thank you for listening. Goodbye.